Hello, everyone. We're here again at Home Instead, as we are for many of our programs that we do for Armstrong. And with me today is a repeat performance. I have with me from Wildlife and Needs, Sue D. Armit. And this time we're going to be doing something else. But before we get to that, introduce our other guest. This Dorothy Krupa. Krupa. She's our capture and transport person from Erie County and um, on our board of directors. And can't live without her. <laughs> I'm sure. So what's the t our title today is what? T the birds of Prey. Right. Well, of course, my first question is what in heaven's name is considered a bird of prey? Well, you're looking at one. Is that supposed to be what? That's an owl. That's an owl. Right. So owls are birds of prey. A lot of so what's bird of prey? Any bird that goes after a smaller animal or goes after another they animal? Be, they're basically, food? yeah. Is it always for food, basically? Right. So birds of prey are birds that survive because they go after, do they also eat other things, insects yes. and that? Oh, but they basically will go after smaller animals. Okay. Sure. Mice. Yeah, or there's oh, mice and animals. Or there's mice yeah. animals. Sometimes small snakes. They're after scavengers, too. You'll find a lot of birds have been hit by cars because they're scavenging on the road. So, you know, you have your eagles. Eagles are scavengers. You have your tur turkey vultures. They're oh, also... Oh, God, I hate them. I don't like them. We've had this discussion like... before. I don't know, no. But the discussion the last time was that you had to like them because they were necessary because they are much like the garbage trucks. They clean up. Right. They're hyenas to the Pennsylvania. You told me that the last time. Right. I felt differently about them. Just like the last time someone was here from a wildlife place, they brought that possum in. Oh, and yes. I said, I can't stand bought possums. They're the worst things in the world I've ever seen. I didn't even want to touch it. And then I was educated and I said, okay, I'll be nice to them. I'll at least allow them to live in existence. I don't like to look at them and I don't want to touch them, but they are important. Yes. So let's go back to the birds of prey. I took us on to a side trip. That's okay. Well, that's what that's all, yeah. Okay, so what are the most common birds of prey? Your hawks, your red hawks. tails. Well, the thing is, hawks are, are um, diurnal, which means they're active during the day. And you have your owls that are active during the night. And so, owls are birds of prey. And owls are birds of prey. Eagles are birds of prey. But they're active all the time. No, mostly during the day. Eagles are, yeah, eagles mostly are during the, day, day. During the night. And the mall. Yeah. And then you have your um, acipiters, which are your cooper hawks and your shepshin hawks, goss hawks that go after birds. Oftentimes, those birds that they do get are those that have some type of disease or have something wrong with them that they're easy to get uh, or not as wary. And usually that's the young as well. You know, um, so most of the situations that we get into for rescues or calls are birds that are hit by cars, fly into window, the birds of prey are chasing a small bird. A small bird has better de dexterity, and the hawk goes right into the window and hurts himself. Before we continue, I wanted to bring in Let's talk for a second. We'll put this on, on hold. But what does your organization do? I don't think we explained it well. Oh, okay. I mean, for someone who has not ever watched one of our programs, mm -hmm. I was intrigued by the name Wildlife in Need. So talk about that, and then we'll go back to the hawks and to the owls and to the eagles and that stuff. Oh, okay. That's good. Um, we are a statewide network for rescuing um, orphaned, injured, and sick wildlife, native species. Of wildlife. Which encompasses what? Uh, give me a bunch. Give me give me six of the six or eight of them. Possums, skunks, raccoons, or your birds of prey, your hawks, um, songbirds. Songbirds, All reptiles, songbirds. turtles, turtles are hit by cars, snakes. And and when you get in your wildlife in need and you get something, where do you take her? To a wildlife rehabilitator. And in our area that would be Tamarack Wildlife, right. Is yeah. that the closest for all of us that are in Crawford County? Yes. Okay. They are. So what in Pittsburgh, I think, can we tell her south? There's, yeah, it's Verona. Oh, okay. Uh, Humane Animal Rescue Wildlife Center. Um, there's Sky Spirit in Venango County. There's Wild Bird Recovery in Butler County. 
So there are <clears throat> some others in other areas, but they're smaller facilities. Tamarack and Humane Animal Rescue are the larger facilities where they have more room, they have more rehabilitators at one site. Humane Animal Rescue is where? Verona. That's, Verona. that's, okay. that's Verona. off the New Kensington. Oh, I know yes. exactly where that is. Okay. So okay. that's where they basically go that. And then people, okay, I'm driving down the road and I hit something and I know it's not dead, but I know it's injured. And I call, what do I call? You call our dispatch number is 814-414-4224. Or can I call the police first? They won't. They may refer you to somebody else or you can call the rehab center. Oftentimes now people have their cell phones with them and they just Google it, you know. Animal Rehab Center. Yes, that there's also the Pennsylvania Association of Wildlife Rehabilitator, PAWR.com, where you can locate the wildlife rehabilitator close, closest to you that are, are in Pennsylvania. So we're statewide, so you know anybody could be traveling anywhere. I go down I-79 I across on I-80, and I could be totally in the middle of the state and see that there's a call somewhere. So um, that's statewide for Pennsylvania? Yes. All, do all the states have that? No. Ohio? No, not that I'm aware of. I think some, some people are in Texas that have a rescue, Colorado. Um, I don't know about California. Nothing up by uh, New York, Erie, you left that way in New York. Not yet. No. Okay. So uh, I hit something on the road. I call you. You dispatch someone to come and get it. Dorothy, that's where you step in. That's what I do. You're the one that does that. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. So you do it too. But right. Yeah. Okay. I'll do, um, yeah. I do what's called capture and transport. So in that case, you get an animal that you believe is still alive and injured on the side of the road. Um, we'll get the basic information from you, obviously, of where you work, hit the best location I can get if you didn't stay with the animal. Let's say you had to go to work or you kept going, so you just told me where it was when you hit it. Then I will drive to that location and look for it, and then if I can find it, I will, um, and it provided it's still alive, I will uh, capture it, put it in a crate, and uh, detain it and take it to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Okay. And then they'll assess it and see if it can be treated. Do a lot of the ones that we're talking about, because we're talking about um, birds of prey and the ones that are injured, are some of the ones that are attacked by larger birds or eagles or hawks or whatever, some of the smaller animals are the ones that you end up getting because they're injured, or most of those that are approached by a bird of prey, are they pretty good at killing them? Mm, yeah, they're one. Okay, so that's, that's important. So we're talking about birds of prey that will really kill smaller animals, but basically they don't injure them. Well, yeah. Most of the time they don't. Yeah, it's pretty much if they go after a smaller animal to eat, they're going to get it. Okay. And they'll eat their fat. Okay, so... Now, their weapons are their talents. Oh, yeah. I watched that on Dr. Paul. When <laughs> someone, someone comes to Dr. Paul and he fixes that for them in talents or something that they find it or whatever. All right, back to the, back to the real thing. So let's okay, talk... Uh, about, wait, wait. Uh, let's back up. You hit something... You call, but also it's good. And people have done this. They've taken like a, a, a bag from the grocery store and tie it on the nearest pole or post or something near where that animal is. And we did have somebody actually take a blanket and lay it over the guardrails. It was a really? large blanket, laid it over the guardrails, and then called us. So anything that I can do when I'm driving down the road that would make it easier for you to find the animal that has been injured? You said like the gar like a who has the blue garbage bag? So it's not um, well Walmart or Giant Eagle or anything like that, or you can dollar, it doesn't matter. Dollar right. Tree and the blanket was a good story too. And then it's easier for you to find. Absolutely. Do you right. always find them? No, no. Sometimes I think. Um, I mean, it is possible the animal was injured and moved a short. A, I mean, I, I search. I, I check both sides of the road. We try looking off the berm. I mean, we, of course, get out of our vehicle. We walk. Well, it's, maybe it wasn't injured as badly as you thought. Um, well, this has been stunned or something, too. That happens sometimes, too. Yeah. Um, well, it just moved far enough into some brush and weeds that we just can't see it. Yeah. yeah. And that's when the birds of prey also show up. Or the turkey vultures. Yeah, the turkey vultures, which are the ones that 
I don't like. They have a little bit of the ability to sniff out. Do they really? Yeah. Yeah, their olfactory sense is better than any other bird prey. Those ugly turkey vultures. Yes. <laughs> oh, my Lord. And they do do a service. They yes, do. They do. They do. Okay, is there anything else we need to talk about? Because I did want to re go back from it there because I was afraid that okay. people that didn't see our first presentation would wonder, what am I doing talking to you two about um, birds of prey when we really need to go back and say what you really do and what Dorothy does. So we write right. that. Is there anything else we need? We to also add? advise, you know, we uh, will listen to a scenario and advise people because some people think that, you know, it's an animal... Um, looks like it has a wing injury, but it's, you know, its wings are out mantling, what we call mantling. They're trying to cover up something they're eating. They may be mistaken as the animal has an in for broken wing. Yeah. And it may not be. Once they're done eating, they're off. Yeah. Hmm. You know. Okay, anything else we need to talk about for wildlife in or should we jump to our little uh, one of the hours later, yeah. Oh, I was going to say one thing. I mean, we're, we're volunteers. We're not trusted and we're volunteers, so there's no fee. If you call us, we'll just, if we have a volunteer available, we'll come out, and there's no fee. You don't need to worry about paying anything. Um, we just want to help you and help the wildlife. And we also, in this area, as in other areas, have people that are retired. Yes. Yep. And you also have an opportunity for people to become volunteers. We do. I mean, that make me laugh because well, three of us are retired. Yeah. I know. And, and, and we all do yeah, something we do involved. Yeah, I do. dogs and you do all the rest. You all like stuff like that. So you have to keep active. We well, do, and you also have the ability to people that are interested in doing something like we're going to talk about. They can always contact you in Wildlife and Mead. Where, right? Yes. Yes. And they can find out when they are, or they can contact Armstrong or contact me or someone and get. We can find you. Here we have, yeah, our website is um, winemergencyresponse.com. Do you do a lot of um, PR programs? You should. We are. We have a new outreach program that yes. we started across the state, so we're already gearing up for that, um, especially around uh, Earth Day, mm -hmm. and especially around anybody that has an open house that's it's wildlife-related, like uh, the rehabilitators. Uh, some of them have open houses that we can actually try to recruit. It's, it's funny. It's helping, we're helping the rehabilitators. We're helping the game. Well, yes. And, you know? and talking about doing outreach and things like that, I I often get called to do programs on therapy dogs. Mm -hmm. And it's people that don't have therapy dogs or never had, or anything about that, but they need to know about us and they need to know what we do. So a lot of it, the group that you go and speak to, I was speaking to a group of motorcycle riders in, oh my God, it's going to be sometime in the next two months. And I'm going down and we're doing an hour and 15 minute program on therapy dogs and where we go and how do people get therapy dogs. So you have to always be looking at that. Sure. Sure. And outreach to get that information out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah. there's a lot of people who see a sacred range of wild animal. And unless you've dealt with it before, you may have no idea what to call. And they do start call. They start calling the animal shelters, and we get mm -hmm. referrals from like the Humane Society or the Anna Shelter in Erie, and we'll get um, the police. They'll call the police, and sometimes the police will tell them to call Tamarack Wildlife Center because you don't know what you don't know. And time is of the essence. Yes. Mm -hmm. so yes. That's why it's important for your message to get out to people as much as possible. Yeah. And they also, you know, the question me come to mind with people. How do I know if it's really sick or injured? That's not uh, what to us to decide. No, no but, but oh, you first. know, there's some things you can look at with an animal and know whether or not it's injured. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, if there's active bleeding, you know, if there's bleeding, there's bugs, especially during the warmer weather when the flies will just, you know, there's blood, they'll come and, you know, yeah. they lay the maggots and that could kill an animal, you know? And then, you know, if they're breathing funny, you know, the hawks, they breathe through their, their mouth. That's how they cool their system down, you know? So yeah. if, if they're, and it could be, you know, our weather's changing so much, I've seen it just in regular days that they're, you know, 
especially even though this isn't a bird of prey, but close to it, the crows, you'll see them panting. You know, their oh, mouths yeah. are open. And, you know, this weather right now is plumbless. We never know what's going to happen. From right, to right. You know, so there are some actual um, signs. And if you're able to approach the animal and, you, and it's supposed to fly and it doesn't fly, it's like, whoop, back off and you know, let's call it. But it's always good for people, if they can, to keep an eye on the animal so that when somebody does arrive, you know, we can get it quickly. We because know. we spend a lot of time searching. Well, I know a lot of people watch these programs. That's what they tell me whenever I'm shopping in different places. So we're going to say now that maybe you need to be contacted to do a program for people on wildlife in need and get the information out because it's it's important. Sure. And if we don't uh, promote it and don't say it's there, so if you're out there listening and you think you'd like to have a program and you're one of those people that says, oh, I'm in charge of such and such program for such and such organizations, who should I get? Get these two and find out more about the wildlife and meat. Okay. Well, or we're... anybody else that we can contact as we now have our outreach person. Anything. Whatever. Yeah. Yep. You first, then you can repress. <laughs> okay, I'm interested in this little guy here. What are yeah. We, what are we talking about this out? He is a bird of prey. Right. Um, definitely, they're not, most of them are nocturnal, mm -hmm. active at nighttime. And I can tell you the reason. I mean, there's certain adaptations that owls have, but I have also seen barred owls. During oh, the barred. Barred. B a r r e d. B a r. -R. Oh, okay. Okay. During the day, I mean, I was talking to my mentor one day at her house, and turned around, and we heard this rustle, and there was a barred owl that got a rodent right in her front yard. Oh, wow. So um, they're normally active at nighttime. Um, they have ad adaptations that are unique to any other bird of prey. Okay, so their eye eyes are so large in their socket that they can't move their eyes like we can left and right. So they. Oh, really? I was gonna think they can probably see anywhere, but they. Well, they do have a lot of peripheral vision. Peripheral, but they can't right. move. Them. But. They move their heads. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't think this little guy moves his head. I can be twist him off. Right? <laughs> so they can turn. They can turn 270 degrees one way and 270 degrees the other way. Okay. So they have 14 neck bones. As humans, we have seven. So we're limited. We can only go as far as our shoulder. An owl has 14 neck, neck bones. bones. That's my bit of knowledge for the day. I'm going to tell people that, then maybe I'll hopefully remember it. That's unbelievable. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, they're unique. They're, they're, you know, it's one of those things, they're just sort of mystical. You know, yeah. there's a little mystic about them. But how they can turn without cutting off their blood circulation is they have sort of elastic type blood vessels. And so, you know, they're, they're longer and more adaptable to being able to turn, plus the holes in the neck bones are big enough that allows them to turn the 270 one way and 270 another. Wait a minute, how, how, how many different types of owls would there be around here, and how do they differ in boy. size? Oh boy, well, they, okay. Okay, I mean, now I'm thinking, I'm thinking of now that I, I was going to be about like this. Okay, that's your great horned owl, or your barred owl. Um, the smallest owl we have is the saw wet owl. Size of, like size of a robin. Size of a robin. Size of a robin. They're cute. Out. They're about yeah, down with I think I saw one of them time. I think whenever Donnie Consta was doing a program for me, I think he talked about there, or maybe he brought one in or something. Saw one, or maybe a screech owl. A screech owl. Oh, screech owls are slightly, so, and slightly so, bigger than a saw one. So the owls that I'm talking about are not the common ones that people normally see all the time around, those big ones I'm talking about. Well, normally people don't see owls. They'll no, hear them. I think so. They'll hear them, but they won't necessarily see them. By chance, they might. People go on for years and don't see an owl, you know, unless it's alongside the road. And then sometimes they think it's a rock, and they pass it, and they go, wait a minute, that thing moved. And you're yeah. talking now about a smaller size owl, like we just yeah. said. It could be anywhere. What's no, all owls, all owls, okay. Yeah, yeah but, from yeah. robin size up to, you know, 20 inches. Yeah. Wow. You know, that's your greenhorn now, the tiger of the woods. 
Now we do oftentimes get calls, well, there's a baby owl and you know, something's wrong with it. And we think about the time of year. Well, if it's in the winter or late fall, the owls have already grown. So people mix up the screech owl Which are the as, a baby, as a baby yeah. great more now, when the great more now is this big. So, and the other thing is, is whenever any bird of prey comes out of the nest, they look larger than, their, than the adults, than the parents. Hmm. Because their wing feathers are longer, they're heavier because their parents have been busy feeding them. Mm -hmm. And so they look like adults, but they may not be. They have their, their long, longer feathers are used like training wheels when somebody's trying to learn how to ride a bicycle. Well, these are their training wheels, their training feathers to help them learn how to fly and build up their stamina. See, when I'm thinking of birds of prey, I'm thinking of an owl. Um, how can a little screech out like this? I think of birds of prey, I think something big going after something small. That's well, what I think of. You but know, a screech owl's not that big. Right, and the barred owls will go after the screech owls and kill them and eat them. Oh, wow. The great horned owl, if there's one coming into their territory that doesn't belong in the territory, they sometimes kill that great horned owl and eat it. Do they eat anything besides um, animals that have blood in them? I guess is what I want to say. Well, yeah, there's... I mean, do they eat, eat grass and stuff like that? No. Uh, not, not necessarily. I mean, they may get something like the barred owl loves to be in water. Oh, okay. And they may drink something that has plankton in them. But you have to think about what they're eating. What does a mouse eat? I don't know. What does a mouse eat? They eat... They, yeah, they eat a lot of those vegetation. Oh, okay. And, and grains and things like that. So they get that nutrition from the mouse in the, in the stomach. Okay, is there anything else we need to know about these little owls or owls in general? So we have your saw-white owl, your screech owl, your long-eared owl, your short-eared owl, um, which are the ones more in the mining areas. And then you have your barred owl, well, the snowy owl um, that we don't know that we have a snowy owl that's nested in Pennsylvania. And actually, it might be bigger than the great horned owl. I have some pictures of great horned owls. Yes, yeah, Like a great, great horned owl that was sitting in a nest because they steal other birds' nests. Hello. And then you have your barred owl. I have a picture of that also. They are cavity-dwelling owls. So they find a hollow in a tree. Right. And they have babies in there. Do they stay here year round or do they do all owls stay in the area or do they take off or do they go south or what do they do? That depends on the type of owl. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always a gray area, no? I know, but you know, it's funny because we're talking about this and they're all around us, but most people don't know anything about them. Okay, your smaller owls, you know, they also eat insects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your sawwood owls and some of, some of your screech owls, not all, what may move depending on the food source. Right now, you know, with our climate changing, everything is changing in general. People are seeing owls or other birds of prey where they normally don't see them, you know, at a certain time of year. Well, North so, oh, good, I'm sorry. so your, your sawwit owls are the ones that actually migrate further because they're following insects. So they could go south or something? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just amazed. Yeah, I wish you had one here. Then we could really look at it. So all these different types of owls. It doesn't have a permit for that. No, I'm sure you don't. But all these different types of owls. Right. Now, the other thing is, is owls not by their sense of hearing. That's their strongest sense. They can see as well. But because their eyes are fixed and they have to rotate their neck, they have these disc-shaped, or in the case of the bar now, heart-shaped face. They're all adapted to being able to listen to a rodent, okay? So their ears are big openings on the bigger owls like this, <laughs> and they're not across from each other. 
they're like one's higher than the other, which gives them the ability to absorb sound evenly into the disc-shaped feathers. <laughs> She's laughing. I, I'm laughing. I never knew that an owl had one ear higher than the other. They do. That's, that's just going to also blow my mind. I mean, I can't believe these things. Well, let's talk to I said, well, so you need to know about owls. I'm, I'm intrigued by these owls. Really? I didn't think I've ever seen them, though. That, that could very well be. Do they um, do, would they, okay, I have a barn. And I have, it's, it, can owls get in barns and stay in barns? They, they can, but um, usually your other birds of prey, like your kestrels, your falcons, will go into a barn. Oh, okay. Um, now there is the barn owl, which declined because of the insecticides that were put out. Um, and they used to be mostly in silos and things like that. So yeah. people try to bring them back to reintroduce them and have built like something inside a barn that allows those owls to uh, breed, have their babies. They stopped doing it outside of the barns because there was other predators that would get to them and that they wouldn't make it. It's so more successful with reintroduction of those. Would you find owls in highly residential areas? You can find screech owls are known to be city owls. They're those little tiny ones. They're yeah. the tiny ones, right? Yes. And you would find them in, in, in like the city cavities, places like that? The cavity, or cavity nest. Yeah. Their cabinets do. I actually live in Mill Creek Township, just outside the city, part of the city limits of Erie, and there's a screech owl nest within a mile of my house that I know of. Whenever they have some of these things where they put up a, a um, video and have it on, uh, on the computer that you can watch, are there videos available? How do people find those things? If I want to watch owls, could I go on the computer and find a nest that's being... It's called, what's that called where they have? Yes, okay, I'm a circle. Yeah. Do they have those for owls too? I bet they probably do. They're all, something. yeah, I'm sure, if, you know, if people want to study them, that's what's happening. But the other thing you might want to do, and I believe it's on the Pennsylvania Game Commission site, uh, or at least it used to be, um, how to build uh, nests for, or nesting sites for the owls. I've never heard of people and that. And... Little screech owls will actually go into a bird nest, nest box, as long as the hole is big enough that they can fit into. Like a bluebird. Yes. Yeah. Just a, just a different size box. You're in mm -hmm. size opening. Right. And you can do that with barred owls as well. Screech owls are more successful, I think, in, in coming to somebody's backyard. Well, I'd be more inclined to put up something for an owl than I would a bat. I'm not into bats. I don't like them at all. No, I don't like them at all. And people put up those bat boxes. No, I'm sure. Well, look, the decline in the in the bats, and bats are so important with, you know, controlling the insects. Seems that's the of that. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, all animals have a purpose. We build it. And, you know, God put them on this earth for some a reason, and sometimes as humans we don't figure out the reason. We often no. talk about that whenever we've done programs on uh, the purple martins mm -hmm. and also on the bluebirds. And I would say to people, wait a minute, the purple martins and the bluebirds need us because we need to put up a nest for them. We need to have the purple martin houses and we need to have the bluebird houses because they don't have the ability, they don't, have, they don't build a nest right. in the middle of a tree. Right. Mm -hmm. So if it's ours as humans, it's up to us to do some of these things to help them along. And people don't realize that. You think? Very good. Tell you the truth, when you're talking about people interaction with wildlife, there's usually a conflict. Um, and we have to learn to live with the conflicts, um, learn to adapt. Um, we've moved into their territory and, you know, that used to be their territory. Right. But they're trying to find a place to survive and they're being pushed out constantly. Isn't that the deer? In, the well, look saying. at what we're dealing with and not talk get off of birds of prey as well. Up on the bayfront, I mean, Dorothy's getting all these calls on these geese and ducks that are, you know, nesting, and all of a sudden they're they're stranded because they're up on a 
hotel balcony or yep. or something that they've made with the dish outdoor mall. court. Can you from mall roof? Oh, I see. You hear so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what that they were in a, it was their nesting site. Well, you know, that they know to come back to that same area. Yeah. yeah. And it's true with birds of prey. They come back to the same area every year. Well, hawks and eagles and all that too. The hawk, wait, who else goes south? The hawks go south? There's some migration. Um, I, I've seen hawks year round, but I again, you. again, you know, it's whatever, wherever their territory is. I would say more of the movement, movement has to do with the younger. Because eventually they get kicked out. The parents don't want them there. We're going to start another, right, you know, right. another group here, you know. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's avail availability of food source. Of course. So you think about when we had that explosion several years ago with the snowy owls, that all of a sudden we saw an eruption where all these snowy owls came down. Most of them came down south, and most of them were the younger because the food was scarce. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it could have been the weather. It could have been something's going on with disease. We don't know. You know what's a shame? The most people don't think about this at all. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I shouldn't say that. I think they would do something about it if they, this is again the, the outreach. They would do something about these things if they knew more. You can't blame people for not doing anything about it mm -hmm. when they don't know what to do about right. it. Sure. Right. I guess that's the way I want to say it. And that, that happens with a lot of things. You know, you can say, mm -hmm. All types of animals. You get angry and this, that, and just because they really don't know any better. Well, let's go back. Uh, we're in, we'll keep on digressing. I know. Wait. Where are we going back to the Oz? Is there anything else about Oz we need to talk about? Um, <laughs> you got me going with everything else. I now. know, but that's okay. You know, um, again, 99% of the animals that are injured are human, or due to human interaction, non intentional. Right. Or it could be intentional, but most of them are not. Those things that are happening now that we're seeing in our environment is the laziness of people not picking up after themselves. And we're talking fishing line. Mm -hmm. Unravel your fishing line and leave it on the ground. Where Guess what? Uh -huh. We had a barred owl that we got a call on in Adams County, hanging from a limb in the middle of a creek. Was, it was steel line. He got his wing caught on that. He did not live. What a shame. We had to get him out. See, people just don't think. And, you know, even all around the lakes, you know, um, Tamarack Lake in, in particular, you know, now that it has water in it, we're seeing an increase of lines. And, and that one year, you know, Dorothy came down to help. And we, there were seven waterfowl that had fishing line entanglement. And fishing line can cause an animal to lose a wing and to lose a leg. We should talk about that sometime. I, I don't think people realize that. And we do have an awful lot of fishermen in this area. Mm -hmm. Of course, with Connie out and Pimentoni and Tamarack and all those places, yes. and even up to Erie. Yep. Maybe what we need to do at some point is do a program on care and awareness of their needs mm -hmm. and how people are just adding to hazardous situations. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, I'm looking at Earth Day. I think our organization is looking at Earth Day, not only as recru a, a recruitment opportunity, but also to teach people how to be stewards and what to do with some of the things that they have in their kitchen that they don't cut or they, you know, like those bottle holders, the six, six packs, yeah. you know, they should be cut. I know that they should be cut up. A lot of people don't know that. No, but a lot of people, before all the other regulations, used to just sometimes burn things like that. We, yeah. yeah. Murders of paper bags and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, now, God forbid, with recycle, we're not allowed to do anything like that, and we're supposed to send all this stuff. So what a lot of people do, they just throw it into the regular garbage, then it ends up in a landfill, then it becomes a hazard to the animals. And, and it's, it's just a vicious circle. Yes. We can't yes. seem to get around because they don't want to do it, but they don't know what the other choices are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people can't burn. Yeah. Unless you're lucky enough to live in some place where burning is permitted, then the names right. get mad. Yeah. It's always something. We can always yeah. smell plastic burning. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. It's just, 
Yeah, there's a lot of things that we can do um, to clean up after ourselves. I mean, I used to fish. Now I don't have time to fish. I love the niche, you know, and I eat what I catch. Um, but, you know, to intentionally take a line off a reel and leave it, that's a disaster for some of these animals. Absolutely. And even some of the things we went out, a, a couple of us went out to try to get an animal. And as we're walking out there, we're getting fishing line wrapped around our feet. Oh, I see, that's just... And then there's, you know, kids run around barefooted in these areas. And it's some of it, it's, it's the county parks. Some of it's the state parks. And, you know, just irresponsibility of taking a hook and cutting it and putting it, taking it with you when you leap. You know, uh, take your fishing line with you. Or I've seen this out at Pymatuming. We've had, we have it on Tamarack Lake. Those things that look like PVC pipes that come down. Those are fishing line receptacles. And you just put your fishing line in there. And usually there's volunteers that empty those out. You know, so there's there's a way to get around all this. And there's some organizations that will take that fishing line, if you mail it to them, um, they recycle it somehow. Wow. You know? So there's a lot we can do to clean up our environment. I mean, take a look, even driving, even driving, there's there's bottles and bottle caps and cans all over. But our hats used to work. To the animals. Yeah, right. yeah. <clears throat> Especially, too, you know, like your yogurt containers, you know, or whatever you're eating. Rinse them out, clean them out so there's no food in there. Because an animal, like especially diverting here, a raccoon, <laughs> you know, they get their head caught. Or a skunk will get their head caught because there's a, a fruity type. People think that's funny. Yogurt. Oh, why don't they think it's funny when things like that happen. That's not. It's not. I just don't see a humor no. in it. Right. We are going to do something with that, especially the fishing line. That really bothers me. It always bothers me. And especially it's with so, so many preventable. fishing areas right here. And I don't know whether or not we can talk to somebody at your organization, but we'll do something with that because that's as important as anything else we've done. And we'll uh, try and give you a voice here to be able to bring some attention to that through one of our programs. Sure, sure, certainly. Back to the owl. <laughs> Is there anything else about the owl? <laughs> Well, their talons are, are very strong, um, you know, with, you know, compared to their body weight, you know, so a great horned owl can have 500 pound pressure behind one of them. Wow. You know, and so they're used in order to grasp, grasp to kill. And they, when they like, you know, when they grasp something, <laughs> they'll hold on to that and not let go until they want to. An owl. An owl. Where a hawk, oftentimes, especially your cooper hawks or the ones that go after birds, they'll make mincemeat out of you. They'll go like that. Mm -hmm. and, and their talons are thinner and able to pierce. Um, the beaks of all birds of prey are used for tearing meat to give to their babies. They also, um, usually owls will eat whole whatever they get. Now, a rat may be too big, but when you're talking a bull, a mole, a shrew, they can swallow them, oh, yeah. but as whole, but they may not be able to digest everything. So they get it in their crop. The fur and the bones of owls only are regurgitated up into an owl pellet. And I know in schools, many times kids dissect owl pellets to see what kind of animal that that owl has eaten. Really? Yes. You cannot do that with hawks because they absorb the bone. They can just throw up the, or whatever you want, like regurgitate up the, the pellet, but it's mm. not something that people study unless they study the, the fur to determine what these animals are eating. Okay, let's go to the next one. <laughs> I'm, into, I'm, into, I'm into hawks. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, the difference between, I want to talk about the difference I see on this paper here. The difference between a hawk and a falcon. I thought, what the heck's a falcon? Like a peregrine falcon or the smaller kestrel that 
we see sometimes perched on uh, electric lines. And there's even another falcon that we see sometimes, I know in Erie County, called a merlin. How do I tell a falcon at my house from a hawk? I see red tail hawks like that. Okay, it, Those are red tail They're hawks. very, very common. It's usually a little stragger. Not necessarily. Right. They're, thin, they're thinner and they have very pointed it, wings. If you see them yeah. flying, if right. you see a hawk flying, and if you're, you know, obviously they're up in the air and you, you see the silhouette. The falcon's wings tend to look that pointy, a little more like a triangle at the end than a hawk might. What do we have? We have both around here a lot of hawks and falcons. We have hawks, falcons, um, and again, you have your, okay, you know, I get technical here. Your budios were the birds with the broader wings. Those are your red tailed hawks, your red shouldered. That's the ones I see. Okay, yes. They're the more common. The acipiters, which are your sharp shin hawks and your cooper hawks, are the hawks that you see fly past horizontal real fast. They have more rounded wing feathers and, and very long tail feathers they use as rudders, and they're the ones that go after the birds. Oh, okay. Okay. Your falcons are the ones, and you, you might see this, and I've seen it going I-90 a lot. Um, you know, the kestrels or those falcons sometimes will hoover in the air with these pointed wings, as Dorothy explained, and just go like this over their prey. I thought that's what the turkey buzzards did. Turkey buzzards can't do that. They sure. chase, do they, turkey they buzzards chase soars. other animals? No. No. They, oh, okay. Just, they can't grab. Oh, all right. Okay. So the reason for their ugly heads <laughs> and, oh, <they're> and, ugly. <laughs> and, and those beaks is they mostly go after their scavengers. So there's a lot of roadkill, you know, everywhere. And, you know, they use that beak to pierce that roadkill <coughs> to get the meat. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I've also seen is that some of these birds of prey help each other out. So the turkey vulture will soar and they're usually in a group. I think they call them kettles. And, you know, they'll come down on something that right. is dead. And they help clean up things. But also, I've seen eagles flying with them. And when the turkey vulture goes down for food, the eagle goes, and he's looking at his sight. And I'm like, oh, that's some food for me. He so he'll come down. And because eagles are bigger, they're chased. The, the turkey vultures away are sort of off to the side and let me get done with what I want here and then I'm going to leave and you can have it. Will the eagles go after a falcon? No, no, a falcon's too fast. Oh, all right. Now I have seen... But I, well, an eagle go after a hawk. If it's down, eagles, eagles are scavengers as well. If there's something down... I call it down. Something injured, something that can't move that fast. You get some of these bigger hawks and eagles that will go after them. I see that yeah. sometimes whenever I'm driving from Connie on over towards Pima Tuning and I go through a, some of those open fields or corn fields or whatever. And many times, they have, when I've ever seen an eagle, that's where it's always been. Right. Down and eating or doing whatever. And Yeah. The eagle will actually soar over a group of geese. And if there's one goose that's not feeling well or has some type of handicap, mm -hmm. um, he'll chase them off by soaring over them. And the one that's left, he's going to get. Which will hawks, hawks will go after small uh, animals like a kitten. Well, they, not as much, but if it's well, there, they don't know the difference between a kitten that's owned by somebody and not. Well, an eagle go after something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So in in uh, Alaska, you don't see cats out. You don't see small cat the dogs out. No, oh, because they're prey. Uh -huh. Could be. Could be. Yeah, they could be. And most of the stories that you hear about red-tailed hawks, you know, going after something because the lady was walking her dog and it came out of a bush, that is usually an immature hawk just learning how to hunt. 
Oh, okay. Okay, and they, you know, the, the stories I see and the pictures I see, I'm like, eh, those, that's an immature. So they're trying to learn how to hunt, and they're just trying to be opportunists when they can and get a meal. So falcon and hawks are about the same size, basically? Close? Uh, it depends. Like you, you I know, it depends because you have them. larger falcons and you have smaller falcons. And you have larger hawks, and you have smaller hawks. You have larger owls, and smaller owls. You know. Do I see your tribe? Oh. Give me a second. Because falcons, but the three that are let's say, yeah most common in Erie County would be a, a merlin, falcon. a kestrel. Yes, a falcon, and and, and a kestrel's not much bigger, but it, it, it may stand a little. I think maybe more upright to make it look taller, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But then a peregrine is going to be. It easily as big as a red tail hog, you know. So peregrine falcon is peregrine falcon yeah. the biggest hawk in your county, or Northwest PA, yeah. she said. And their bodies are much slimmer than the falcons on earth. Yeah. What's the what's unique about um, they they have found this? This is from National Audubon. Um, mm -hmm. Is there was some way that somebody figured out that the kestrels or the falcons can see UV in the urine of the rodents. And they follow that trail of the urine till it stops and they go after it and there's the rodent. Wow. I know, I mean, these are new things that have come out within probably the last five years. Are these are people that need to get a life. <laughs> Yeah. You're chasing, yeah. checking out the urine in an animal. Oh, come on. That's a little over the game. It's just not making Wow. And people are intrigued by animals and what they eat and how they see and how, you know. Oh, yeah. Because hawks are, hawks are dependent on their sight to be able to see things in order to catch them. How far can these animals basically see? Is there any? Red tailed hawk can see a small rodent two miles away. I don't know if you feel type situation or anything like that. I was, I don't know, I was sitting what about in my, hawk? my backyard. The red tail, the hawk. Yeah, the red tail, the red tail, I, I saw a spot up, I, I was in my backyard talking on the phone with somebody. I saw this spot, because I'm always looking for birds, and I had a bird feeder in my backyard that was like where that wall is. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm talking, and I just stop talking, and the person knows me. He said, why'd you stop talking? And he says, I have to be quiet. And this hawk came down feet first, not kidding you, mm -hmm. just dropped from the sky and tried to get something that was under my bird feeder. It was a spot up there from where I could talk. You can, can you go see as far as show? Okay. Yeah. Wow. They have incredible sight. Incredible sight. Now, going back to falcons too, the peregrine falcon is the fastest diving bird of prey that we have. And so you see hers around the water in places like that. You don't know. That's, that's your water. osprey. That's your osprey that you're thinking about. They are adapted to going. Actually, they dive into the water and can go underwater, grab their prey. When they grab the fish. They come up, but they have to position the fish so it's head first, so that they can carry it over to the nest. You were going to show us something. I don't want to run out of time here. Oh, okay. I'm going to show you. Okay, this little guy's injured, and here we have a technique that we tell everybody, and I've even had to tell people how to capture porcupines this way. This is called the box over technique. No, but was, what about uh, the skunk? Yeah. Oh my. Yeah, God. I just had one that we got a call in Armstrong County. Oh, my boy. Yes. Okay. So, so yes. Um, <laughs> she's like, I'm not going to box you, <laughs> but thank you. So the box over technique is used when an animal is on a pretty um, smooth and flat ground. This one? And it's an animal that cannot move very far, very quick. It's one you don't want to be chasing with the box. You don't want to chase wildlife. So this owl is sitting there, and of course he's going to be looking at you when he's, you're approaching him, but he's pretty far down, you know, and he's not moving much. 
Um, what we tell people to do is get a box, and what I do is fold the flags to the box inside the box, okay? And you go, and you can approach it, put the box over like this. Now, for the general public, if they're too scared to do anything else, we may be able to come out and have one of our wildlife couriers get this yeah, down because it's contained, okay? So what we ask is please put some weight on top of the box. Now, a board and a, and a rock is fine. We don't want something that's going to, you know, came in this, this box. So the other thing is, is, you know, when you're approaching a hawk, for example, they go down on their back. We'll pretend this is a hawk. Okay. okay. He, he looks like he's okay right now. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we can look at it as us, or if the person that's covering it over wants to see which direction the feathers are going. You don't want to put this piece of material sliding it under up against the feathers. You want it to go along the feathers or along the fur, depending on what kind of animal you have. You take another flat piece of material. It can be another cargo box. It can be anything. Just a little bit bigger than the box itself. That you can go like that. And if you find that, oh, okay, you know, I feel a stop. So I'm just going to zigzag a little bit. There you go. You have that. And then you take... Um, strong tape, whether that would be tape from, you know, the packaging tape or duct tape or gorilla tape, mm -hmm. and you tape this in a bottom to the top bo a box on all sides, and then when you pick this up, you can That's put your hand over this way and have your hand on top like this, and then they can take it into a safe place, or the courier can take it and put it in their car. Wow. You know, so I've told people how to do this. I could, when I was a rehabber, I couldn't go after everything. Um, I went after as much as I could, but I had somebody do this with an adult porcupine. Because the porcupine doesn't throw the quill when they see you approach. If they're touched, that's when the, the quill will expel itself. So they put this big box over top, slid something underneath it, and they brought it to me. You know, so this is the safest way to uh, capture an animal that is really down, and it eliminates the sight of us as the two-legged, and that thinks things are cuter, like smile. The animal thinks, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to get eaten." They're scared to death. They really are. Yeah. And you eliminate that. And it's dark and warm, quiet is the best thing to keep an animal that's injured from going further into shock. Is that what happens? That many animals? Oh, absolutely. They, die, they can die of shock. People die of shock. Well, of course they do. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's stress myopathy with the animals, too. I mean, if you think about it, if you're faced with a lion, and you're faced with a lion for 15 minutes, you aren't kidding me, your heart's not gonna be able to do too much more. Well, you know, that's, that's how we are to the animals. We are big, you know. Also, a hawk and an eagle, when they're frightened and you're approaching them, they will sometimes flip over on their back. And the reason is, is because their talons are up in the air and if you're gonna reach down, they're gonna grab. Yep. You know, if you put this over them, or if, you know, in the case of a capture and transport person, you know, cover the head, make sure you cover the animal, make, always make sure you cover the head so they don't see you coming, you know. Um, are there ways that the average person can um, avoid doing things in their yard or on their property to avoid the types of things that the smaller animals would be going after that would be the food for the falcons and hawks in there. Well, in other words, should I pick up the garbage and stuff like that? Is that a yeah. bird feed? Well, always. Well, and you're going to have other animals coming to your bird That's feeders, all it does. You know, so, you know, you have to think about 
what what you want to do. I mean, a lot of a lot of people ask, how can I get rid of these hawks that come in and get the birds I feed? But you just feed or not? But they don't want to. No, of course they. You know, so <laughs> you're going to have to live with the fact that One the you're providing for this other animals to come in and eat. And then what spills off on the ground? Well, then you have more chipmunks and you have some more rats and mice and rodents coming in. You know, so yeah, you have to think about what you're doing. What's the three most important things you want every, but uh, you give me two and Dorothy can give me two. Four most important things we should remember about birds of prey. That's we're at the end of our program. Okay, so whenever you have any question whether an animal needs help, a bird of prey needs help or not, please call. Please call. Good. Right. What do you get? To? Um, this goes a little bit to what you were saying. For those who have hawks and, and owls and things around your home, one thing you can avoid doing that is beneficial for birds of prey is using poisons and toxins on mice. Yeah, I mean, I understand none of us want mice in our homes, but there's other ways to eliminate them other than just a general rodenticide or poison because if those small mammals eat it, they pass away or they're not moving as quickly so they're easier for the owl to get or easier for the hawk to get and now you've just gone up the food chain and you could have poisoned another animal. That also happens with dogs and cats. Yes. yes. So yes. often. The yes. dogs yes. have yep. it is. Yep. It into something they shouldn't be into yep. and now we've got a poison dog or a poison, poison yes. cat. Yeah, so that's on. That was a big one. Do you have another one? Yes. Uh, oftentimes, no, she's last. No, no, I got any three. I was still. Uh, I thought that was. I got that's a points. cheater. I got double points. Did you? Oh, okay. yeah. I got double points. Okay, a lot of birds are flying into windows because during a certain time of the day, uh, the way the sun hits the atmosphere or whatever, you know, that the window reflects like a mirror. And so they, the hawks think they're going to going into more woods. So trying to eliminate that, um, whether you use, uh, there's bird away products that you can put on that you can actually see through, but it has UV light mm -hmm. lighting in it that will alert a bird, oh, that's not right because it's coming closer. What I've done, because I have a wraparound porch with a lot of glass, I have actually put bird netting that you put over your berry bushes. Mm -hmm. I've actually lined the outside of that that's, that faces the windows. And, and it's like now if they do hit it, it's like a trampoline. Yeah. They don't hurt, you know? So there's a lot of collisions with windows. Bird so netting. trying, yeah, so trying to, and you have to look at your situation. Yeah, you know, cool. I mean, there's twirler things, there's, you know, you can put, if you want to make your house look like a party house, you can put ribbon out that moves with the wind and stuff like that. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you. you. We kept and we thank Armstrong as well. We kept on going off topic, but it was good. Dorothy, thanks for having that. Mary, you and close by so you didn't have to travel too much to get there. <laughs> and we'll work on some other things. We, yes. It was interesting. Thank you both. Thank you. I'm sure it was a good program for people to find out things about birds of prey. And there's more. There's more. Always more. <laughs> Thank you.